So when we think about communication, half that battle is actually listening to understand, listening to involve, not just listening to respond. Val Grubb is a keynote speaker, executive coach, and trainer. She's the author of Clash of the Generations, Managing the New Workplace Reality. Across her career, ton of cool things. Began her career as an engineer with Rolls-Royce. Uh, Jaime has a few of those in his garage. Mm -hmm. As the vice president of strategic operations at NBC Universal, she also spearheaded on-air quality initiatives for the 08 Summer Olympics in Beijing. She played a big role in the 99 formation of Oxygen Media and its subsequent success, which led to the company's purchase by NBC Universal in 2007. In Val's book, Clash of Generations, she said, every generation in the workplace has value, their own strengths, their own weaknesses, and their own unique talents. As we think about the future of work today, we need to be thinking how we unlock the full skills and capabilities of every worker. Here's Val Grubb. Let's bring it in. Let's do it. Well, Let's do Val, it. I am excited to talk. I, uh, full transparency, I was given clash of the generations by a colleague, uh, you know, a bunch of, uh, bunch of months back and I ripped right through it. It's, um, uh, an awesome read. So that's why I wanted to talk with you today, I guess to maybe, you know, kick, kick it off for folks who don't know, maybe give them a little background on yourself and your practice and your work and your book and start at the beginning. All right. That sounds great. Well, I will make it very quick, though. So I am an engineering by by training. Um, I worked for an aircraft engine manufacturer uh, after graduation for, gosh, a long time, decade or so, and then moved over to the business side of things, helped to found two companies, IAC for Barry Diller. Uh, we bought Home Shopping Network and Ticketmaster and Expedia bought match.com didn't help me get a date which i'm still a little angry about sam i gotta admit um and was there for gosh three years and then moved over to help uh, found the oxygen channel for oprah winfrey marcy carsey and some other folks and i was with them until we sold the company and now to nbc universal uh, and now i've been out on my own for 15 years and I teach the, I really focus on the skills needed to move from tactical thinking to strategic leadership. Uh, and that included writing a book, as you've mentioned. Thank you for that. Uh, it's on, it, it's called Clash of the Generations, Managing the New Workplace Reality. And it really is a manager's guide to how to up your people skills, how to, it, it's really about people management for anybody who's done it for a long time, and if it's something new for you, that this book has got something for a little bit for everybody. On on that specific topic, on Clash of the Generations, um, you know, you wrote it a, a few years ago. Uh, the the world is, you know, other stuff has happened in between that is uh, even maybe accelerated future of work as we talk today. You know, you can't turn the television on without hearing about chat GPT and AI. I think I just saw the White House doing a meeting about it. So a lot of stuff is sort of, you know, um, technology and uh, and work is shifting. I guess what what is what has proven most important uh, in your opinion for managers to consider as they think about their generational workforce? What is what is most important? Oh my goodness, so many things because it really, there's just been so much change and uh, really change on the expectations. You know, millennials, I think, drove a lot of this to begin with. And then life has intervened and caused a lot of this and, you know, sort of Gen Z sort of on steroids. Um, I, I think the biggest thing at the top is just where you work, flexibility in 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 the work hours. And, you know, this new generation and now it's interesting because, you know, this new generation, like out of COVID, like, you know, it's this idea now of working in an office for 40 plus hours a week. Uh, I mean, people just look at you like you got two heads anymore. And um, particularly because we proved that we could do it in, in, in a lot of different instances. And so, you know, I think that that's typically what I say at the top of the 
uh, the list that as a, as a manager, you're going to have to deal with. Uh, and you're right, technology, uh, no two ways about it. Like, like Gen Z, they're going to expect you to have the latest and greatest technology, and they're going to want to implement and exploit the latest and greatest technology because they have, they have never experienced a world without it. Uh, I think another thing is people question, why are we doing it this way? Like I, I remember starting out and my boss said to do something like, I think I would have been fired had I asked him, well, why are we doing that? Why are we doing it this way? And now I'd be shocked if I don't get that question. So just a lot has really changed in expectations um, on managers, um, just so much so. It's completely a different, um, really a different environment versus when I started managing. Um, and so it's, it, but for me, I can say this, Sam, that it's more exciting because I feel like it's driving my leadership, my people leadership skills. Um, it's, it's driving them to a new level. So instead of, I always, I always, when I'm coaching folks, I say, you know, don't be, don't be annoyed. Don't be angry. Uh, we were all in our 20s once and guaranteed you probably pushed the boundaries of whatever those boundaries were. Uh, this generation is just is just making us be better leaders, better managers. Yeah, I love that. I think that's um, you've got to continue to adapt, right? I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. And that really is the you know, really is the key is just thinking about things differently. Um, and, and just, it's not business as usual. And I mean, we saw that during COVID, right? I mean, I hate to keep going back to that, but I'll tell you, there's a lot of businesses that aren't, that aren't around now because they weren't able to adapt and that's not slowing down. Like that's not, we're not going back to business as usual pre COVID. Uh, it is really about exactly to your point, Sam, that we have got to keep evolving, got to keep adapting. What are, the, what are like the specific, to double click on that, what do you think are the specific, when you say we're not going to go back, what are like some specific areas that if you were talking to a senior leader about, because uh, you spend a lot of time keynoting and advising and consulting and training on, on this area, what would you advise senior leaders to um, not um, cut corners on, uh, um. not pull back on, not reduce budget on in order to make sure that they're moving their workforce in their business in the right direction versus kind of going back. Yeah, absolutely. I can tell you the biggest thing I would say is, is um, learning and development. Like this, if you want this group to stick around, uh, this group is incredibly smart, and they want, the moment they start getting bored, they're going to move somewhere else. And the moment that they stop learning, they're gone. They're out, they are updating their LinkedIn and rolling out of here. And so we really, and, and, but it's not just, and actually what I would say is it's actually not, we're not just training Gen Z. It's actually training uh, Gen X. It's tra tra training millennials on things like giving feedback. We have to give more feedback to this generation than any generation I've ever seen. Is that really going to kill you? Like to get, oh, I got to give more feedback. Who cares? Just do it. If it's what they need to do in order to be better employees for you, make it happen. Make it happen and be that strong communicator. And I think that we really need to think about development at all levels and not just assume, because I think a lot of times we want to train the, you know, train Gen Z, train the young people to be more like us. And that's just not going to happen. Um, it's really about developing our managers, developing um, senior leaders, developing anyone who's in a management position to be a better leader for the folks who work for them now. And, you know, I think of communication um, feedback, coaching. These are skills that you may not have had to use, uh, you know, and, and yet you've been this staggeringly successful people leader. 
Now, people who have been great leaders are struggling because they haven't adapted their, how they approach this new set of employees. And so we really need to focus on that and 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 really kind of up people skills at all levels. Uh, I would certainly, so like I said, I would certainly say again, that development, um, feedback and coaching. Uh, I would also say, you know, I, you know, I think it's also uh, about just really upping communications. And I guess feedback and coaching are, are examples of communication, but things like transparency, um, you know, look at who would have ever thought we would be in a situation where, where salaries are posted online. Like who would have ever thought that would be the norm. And yet it is this new generation really driving transparency. And, and so that they can come in um, and ask why again. And so just so many things, I, I think those are probably what really comes top of mind, Sam, is, uh, you know, again, this communication, feedback, coaching, and, and part of communication, I would certainly say is listening. You know, one of the things that I would say is the biggest thing is if you don't listen to Gen Z, they're gone, as they should be, by the way. Like not listening to people just because they're young is probably one of the worst things you can do. So when we think about communication, half that battle is actually listening to understand, listening to involve, not just listening to respond. I'm waiting for you to be done so then I can respond and tell you how you're going to do it. And so that to me, those are all learned skills um, of, of which we just need to focus on. You, you had said um, old habits, not old people kill innovation. Um, the, I don't know, did you, did you recently, see, it's like the last few weeks, it's almost like some CEOs have just either gone crazy or just not realized people record things. Did you see the CEO who was, uh, Quoted oh my, on a, on a Zoom call talking about uh, Pity Island. Don't go, you know, get off. Oh my and, God! Not Herman Koch. It's the folks who make the Air Aeron chairs. Um, <laughs> yo, my God! Could you believe that? And uh, and then it, you had and then you had the other gentleman who said again. It was like back to back. Who made the comment about uh, have to come back to work and uh, pointed out that an employee sold their dog so that they can come back to work and we need to be doing more of that. I don't know if you saw that one too, but it was like- That one I didn't see, but I can tell you I'm gonna go hunt that rascal down. I mean, <laughs> thank God for these people because it's gonna get like, I got work for, for decades. <laughs> but it's like, amazing it's though. I'm like, what reality are these people in? I mean, how can that board possibly keep that, keep that, keep that woman a CEO? It's just incredible to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I, it, that came to mind as you talked about transparency and feedback, because, you know, that's maybe an example of, uh, I would, maybe it's being too transparent about it. <laughs> maybe it's like an example of, of, uh, but it definitely, I think we're, you know, you were living in a moment in time where, you, you know, things are moving faster than ever. And there is natural transparent things, Communication can happen quicker if you do the wrong thing. It's going to move fast. Maybe even yeah. on the other side, if you're transparent about positives, they'll move just as fast. Um, you're in your book. You know there was a lot of research that you cited and quoted. Uh, is there? Do you find yourself as you're talking to senior leaders and managers and reinforcing the points you're making on feedback or on uh, transparency? Is there any data, research, studies, or stories you constantly find yourself coming back to to convince? others about why this is an important um this you know this is an important change that uh, they should be taking on well it's interesting one of my first questions that i ask is how's your turnover so it's their own data that i refer to how many promotions are you making are you bringing in lots of young people but yet they're not staying to the next level so i have a tendency what i find to be and, and there's lots of data out there that supports this, but everybody goes, oh, that's somebody else. As we saw with that video, like that clearly that CEO thinks this is somebody else's problem. And my question is, is are you getting work done? 
are you, are you hitting your goals? Are you, what's the turnover? Are you promoting people? Do you have a secession plan? That's the data that I always tell folks to look at, because let me tell you, you can find data that supports any, and, and obviously I talk about a lot of data in the book, which I think is helpful, but when I'm coaching a CEO on what to do differently, it's talk to me about where your organization is, because then it really comes in and has a much more profound effect um, because it, they see the gaps in people sticking around for longer, uh, them not having secession plan, key people leaving and just being dorked by it because you don't have anybody to fill their position. Um, great leaders leaving and taking whole staffs with them, particularly when we see this non-compete coming out next year. Like there are some serious ramifications or the fact that you can't put somebody in a, you know, in a non-compete or you can't put them in a place where they can't talk about what they've done. Um, so I find the most compelling data to be their own. And that frightens senior leaders. And so when you're looking at this journey, it is really about taking just a cold, hard look at, at your numbers and seeing, are you setting yourself up for the future? Not only all these things that are easy to compare, but things like, you know, your, your sales numbers towards employees, um, you know, revenue, revenue by employee. Are you seeing that number go up? Um, how can you do that going forward? Are you teaching your people to meet the skills? Do you even know what the skills are that you're going to need five years from now or 10 years from now? That right there is the data that people don't have. And so if you need to start with your own strategy and inward of what's going on and then take a really hard look at what you are missing and then start focusing and then get focusing on what where we're going and how exactly we're going to get there you know the, the point you made around learning and development is often an area in a business that is thought of as a nice to have instead of a i don't know you you know what I'm saying? Nice to have versus need to have. It is something that is, was, I think the first thing to go, I don't know if there's a lot of data to support it just yet, but I think during COVID as HR teams got let go, they, you know, a lot of organizations lost. Maybe the only people in the company thinking about those types of functions and responsibilities, whether they were doing them right or wrong is a different conversation, but at least the right. people at the controls were, you know, uh, removed and, um, so I guess as you think about how do you get a senior leader uh, to um, look at learning and development investments as just as important as investing in the customer or the guest experience? Uh, what what are the things that you find yourself trying to you know try to in trying to persuade a senior leader? Well, and I think you know. I I look at that and say, yeah, you're right. HR is the catalyst for learning and development, but really that's on the leaders. That are, What are you doing to signal to your direct report? So as a CEO, do you read books with your, um, you know, do you teach your direct reports? Do you read books on leadership? Do you have conversations on leadership? You know, I don't need an HR department to tell me to do that. If, if they're seeing their, their CEO who really takes the approach that by sharpening my direct report skills and then requiring them to do the same with their employees, um, I think that that's a, like you don't, you know, yes, you need an HR person, um, but I think it's indicative, uh, it's indicative of all I think it's on all leaders. The moment you sign on the line that you are managing people means that you constantly have to be sharpening your abilities. I think that's part of the management responsibility that you've signed up for. And so as a CEO, do you give great feedback? Do you do uh, coaching? 
do you coach your employee, your direct reports on how to give great feedback, on how to give, on how to coach their employees? Do you look at, and when you have open positions say, all right, who's ready for this? Who are we? Or do we automatically go outside and think that somebody outside is going to be better? Or, or are we thinking about secession planning and figuring out how do we move, you know, how do we move Fela into another job? Because, you know, I'm looking at her for as a general manager. She needs to be in all of these different roles. How much of that? And, and if you take that approach that it is about continuing to elevate your employee skills then that that and then requiring your managers to do that that's how we get starts at the top and goes down like because look an hr person can roll out the best training i'm telling you the best training you've ever seen on let's say managing employees but if it's not demonstrated at the top eh, you know what save your money uh, because it really it's about the culture of whether or not you're demanding the best from your leaders and demanding the best from yourself. And so, you know, I used to run a book club at Oxygen. We read books every quarter um, because it was just interesting and it was a way to learn, to keep learning my skills. And, and you know, I mean, we made it fun because I'd walk in and go, oh my God, have I, how have I been in management for this long based on what I just read in Radical Candor, you know, or things like this. And so there, we don't need big budgets to do that. We just need to care enough about it to focus and think about how can I help my manager succeed? And that means how much mentoring do I do one-on-one? -on -one? How much mentoring and coaching do I do with my staff altogether? so that I'm showing them it's a priority. It sounds to me, I mean, I, I love that. And I think it sounds to me uh, in that one example, it was like a level of vulnerability that managers today uh, maybe need to exhibit as they are learning as well, uh, that may set a good example. Tell me if I'm wrong. Like it might set a good example for younger workers who, um, yeah, you're trying to set the tone. And, and so many frontline managers today, you know, you think about, we talked about this before, like in the restaurant category, where so often than not, the frontline manager, maybe a few seconds earlier, was just the bartender. And yep. they're thrust into this role with the responsibility of other of others uh, and the stress of that. Um, they need to be able to have, to your point, the tools and systems, but uh, also having the vulnerability uh, to accept that, you know what, we're all beginners kind of right at some level and constantly learning. Well, isn't that the whole thing? I mean, gosh, so much, so much, so many goodies to unpack in what you just said, Sam. You know, if you think about servant leadership, the whole idea of servant leadership is that inverted pyramid, meaning I'm not at the top of the pyramid. I'm actually at the bottom holding everybody else up. And in that, if my real goal is to unleash as a as a manager, my goal is really to unleash the abilities in the folks who I have been charged with. And that, you know, I don't know what, what excites you may be different than what excites, you know, Tyrell over here. And so being vulnerable of saying, hey, tell me how I can be the best leader to you. Uh, because what I do for Sam may not be the same thing for Tyrell. And that is, and you know what? Sometimes I've come back and said to you know, I had a, a woman working for me who I could tell the moment she started shutting down. And I'm like, hey, Susie, I, I need you to know something in what I'm doing is shutting you down. And I don't know what that is. Can you help me to understand what that is? And she gave me some pretty tough feedback. And my only response was, I bet you that was difficult to share uh, based on I have a strong personality. I bet you that was difficult to share. I really appreciate it. Said, I'm going to think on this and I'll tell you, I'm going to do my best because I need you. I need you to not shut down. And so can we work together to figure out when I start to overwhelm you, can you say nothing? Just give me a timeout sign. Would you feel comfortable doing that? And I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll lower myself because when I get fired up, 
I speak louder. I speak with more force. All of these things that were just bowling her over. And it was amazing in four weeks. So I, I said, I don't have all the answers, but I'm willing to work with you. And if I can. And so exactly to your point, Sam, about being vulnerable. I always say that, you know, I just, I just I'll tell you, I just had a coaching session this morning with a gentleman who's new to um, new to being a manager and interesting. He's been in there a while, like, like coming up on a year and he's not doing well. They've given him no training and no, even the, the CEO is not spending time mentoring him. And so he was promoted because he's a fabulous individual contributor. Now, everything he knows has nothing to do with leading employees. So he's got to leave all that behind. And now it's about motivating and engaging and firing up other people. And to do that, like if, you're, if you don't want to send to school or send a money, that's fine. Then you're going to have to do it yourself as a leader. And I said to him, I said, look, you don't need to be, you are the expert walking in in your segment, but you don't need to know all the answers. The key is, is you've got others to rely on. So, and it's back to exactly your point about that vulnerability. Get comfortable with the fact that it isn't always going to be great. It isn't, you're still learning. Look, I'm always learning and I've been managing people for 30 years and I'm still learning. So, and if we can take that approach that I, I'm, I'm good at what I do, I, I can motivate and engage. Can I do that hundred percent across the board? Nope. And can I do that coming in? No, because I got to learn the employees and that's all right. It is a, it's about having that open communication and really being, um, really being open to learn, really being open to learn and, and then taking even feedback that we receive and not being angry or you don't understand and seeing where we can come in and be a better leader for that employee. You probably didn't expect this question, but I have a feeling uh, that you're, you'll, uh, you'll have a great answer to it. I so like I'm it. Gonna, I'm going to ask, <laughs> uh, you know, there's all types of books over the, you know, decades that have been managed, you know, applaud, you know, adopted by managers in different eras, you know, good to great, Seven habits. You know, every every Some great you know, ones so you just are, whipped out. Yeah, like there's always something, and then there's always CEOs that like latch on to one, and that's their system. Which which book do you feel like we should get rid of? Which book would you Ooh. wish executives would stop uh, quoting or um, get off their desk because maybe it doesn't fit anymore? Is there any model that people need to let go of? Yeah, I mean, I hate to say this, but I feel like the Jack Welch area, era, you know, I mean, he's written a lot of, and look, I mean, the dude was, I mean, very clearly, he drove GE to new heights that no CEO after him has been able to, to really see. And I just... I think that would be if if Jack Welsh were in charge today, it, I think it would be a very interesting, you know, a very interesting to see if he would have as much success now as he had back then, because I think that it was it's just such a different, just such a different, you know, leadership is just different. Leadership in 2023 is just very different than when he was in charge. And so, you know, I know we all like it. And look, the, the, the guy obviously was a genius, uh, but I just don't know that that would not be my first book to go towards yeah. uh, if I was trying to, you know, trying to learn how to manage, if you will. I hear you. Well, Val, I appreciate your time. Last question for you. You know, a lot of what you're talking about affects this future of work moment we're in um so i want to ask you what is your hope for the future of work oh my gosh i hope we just start listening um i hope that we i think that there needs to be listening all in the in the world and just um being more tolerant of you know we talk about diverse views we everybody talks about we want yeah we want opposing viewpoints in the room, but really we don't. Um, and so I, I guess I just hope for the workforce of the future 
that we actually care about folks, others who report to us versus bet more than ourselves and that we actually just listen and understand that to have the honor of being somebody's leader, um, there's, you know, there's responsibility with that. And we have to take that very seriously and really be the best leader that that employee needs. And that's what I hope that we, that we kind of embrace this change and stop trying to go back and instead keep moving into the future of what work needs of what our employees, what our workforce needs. Val, thank you for taking time. Oh my gosh, you're so welcome, Sam. Thank you so much. This has been very fun. We need to give more feedback than ever before. That's what Val said as she was talking about how we unlock the full capabilities and skills of every worker. We need to give more feedback. We need to find opportunities, not just to train and develop, but to coach up and to inspire and to motivate. Also loved uh, some of the things Val had to say about, hey, we shouldn't be cutting back on learning and development right now. Now is not the time to be doing it, even though that's what happened during COVID. Uh, but we need to double down on our investment in the things that prepare our people, not just for the job they're in now, but the job they're going to be in tomorrow. Also liked what she had to say about her hope for the future of work more listening in a time where you know it's a lot of a lot of noise on linkedin our best leaders our frontline managers they need to unlock unleash they need to unleash the abilities of their people the ones they're charged with as val said they didn't need to do it by listening and being where they are so thanks to val grub for taking time to talk to us today on bring it in if you haven't already go on over your local bookstore and look up val grubs clash of the generations managing the new workplace reality now don't forget to subscribe to bring it in so you never miss an episode we've got some awesome guests lined up that you're not going to want to miss now back to work